Hey everybody, this is Brandon from On Grade. It's episode 12. Uh, we're continuing what we were doing on episode 11 about equipment. I got Devin Boudreaux in studio, my go- my co-host. What's going on guys? Welcome back. Uh, and tonight we have Brian Peters from Advanced Track Equipment. He's the owner of Advanced Track and he's also the COO of Moss Utilities here in Dallas, Texas. So How's Brian, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So, uh... Typically, what we do is guests, when we have them on the show, we ask them a little bit about themselves. So, spill the beans, man. Where'd you grow up? You know, when were you, how old are you? All that good stuff. Yeah, I'm 37. Um, grew up in Bakersfield, California. Born and raised there. Um, went to school for construction management. Started working for a big uh, dirt excavation roadway uh, contractor in the Bay Area. Um Got a got a taste of some 657s and uh, paving about 3,000 tons a night from my first job and um, haven't really ever looked back on the construction industry. Um, originally got started in construction through my family's business. They had an equipment rental business there in Bakersfield and just really fell in love with construction equipment and just everything that goes along with it. So um, that's my background on that side of things. Um, but yeah, I've... Uh, I love this industry, love talking about it, love talking about the equipment. Um, so I'm glad to be here. We're glad to have you. So what year did you come out to Texas? 2018 is when I moved here. Nice. I originally moved to a small town outside of Austin called Dripping Springs. Mm-hmm. Moved down there, um, still working for my family's business actually at the time. Um, and then in 2020, just decided that I needed to do my own thing. So tried to figure out exactly what that looked like right out of the gate. Thought about consulting, thought about buying and selling and trying to flip machines and that type of deal and did that for about a year. And then, uh, like we were kind of talking about earlier, had the opportunity to get started in the equipment rental business. And, um, that's where we're at now. Yeah. So what, what would you tell the listeners about starting up? So we've been talking to them about ideas for the best equipment to start with and, we were talking about really small guys this last episode. So we were talking about guys that weren't really doing like site work. They're doing more like the grinding work or driveways, power and pads, stuff like that. But what about the guys that are wanting to get into site work that are just starting up too, though, that don't want to go the private route. They want to go say commercial and industrial route. What would you recommend for them? Yeah, I think, you know, I think it all depends on application, right? Depends on the, the, uh, the geo that you're working around, right? Like everyone's, geotechnical reports look different. So it's important to understand those and understand what's going to be needed for, for the projects that you're bidding on. And I think the biggest thing, and I mean, obviously people are going to sit here and say, Oh, well, you're an equipment rental guy. Of course you're going to say this. Right. <laughs> but the most important thing is like, don't go lock yourself into a bunch of debt. Right. Especially if you're starting out, it's easy. It's maybe not as easy as it was a few years ago, but you know, a few years ago when you could go literally buy a skid steer 0% interest for 60 months or 48 months. It's easy to go wrap yourself in that. And I know like kind of what you were talking about with the guys that are grinding, you know, a lot of the guys that I ran into and down in dripping Springs kind of similar situation, right? Land clearing, stuff like that. Right. So they're all going to go grab a skid steer. They're all going to go get, um, you know, some type of, uh, you know, a, a grind air attachment or, a um, mulching, heads uh, yeah, and, a stuff, mulching yeah. head and stuff like that. Right. So it's, that's kind of the the path is kind of set there, right? For what you're capable of doing. But if you think about it from through the lens of like, hey, let's go, let's go try to do. And what I see is I see a lot of guys, they start like that and then they want to go get into something else, but they don't have the right equipment for the job. Now, skid steer is one thing, right? I mean, you could pretty much use one of those on nearly, nearly every, every job, job right? <laughs> but, um, but the way I look at it is look through the lens of, hey, let's see what we're going to be really good at, right? And what do we think that we're good at today? And let's go try to do those jobs and make sure that we are before we go invest in a, you know, a $300,000 excavator or whatever it is. Cause site work is, I mean, there's, and site work varies, right? I mean, you, you could have a guy who wants to build a QT. You could have a guy who wants to build a, you know, um, a giant, you know, several hundred thousand square foot, uh, warehouse. Right. So there's, there's a lot of different avenues that you can take to get there. And I think, renting the equipment's a great place to start to really figure out like, Hey, what am I going to be good at? What am I good at? What do I think I'm good at? And actually vet that. Right. 
Yeah, for sure. And and it's you started it and you think you're going to do X and you start doing it. You do one job and then someone asks you to do something else. And next thing you know, six months later, you're doing the complete opposite scope of work. Yeah. And it snowballs from there. And that's the thing that a lot of people don't think of is, you know, they have it in their head. Oh, I want to do this. And you start with that. You get to the job and next thing you know, three days later, you're doing something else because someone didn't show up and yeah. then it just snowballs and you're, exactly. you know, you're in a completely different line of work than you thought you were going to go into. So personally, my opinion has always been start with renting, you know, don't buy off the hop because what you think you're going to do and what you're actually going to end up doing are likely going to be different things. Very seldomly do you start down the path and you know, you know everything because typically when you're starting it, you don't know anything. Yeah. So you get into it and then it changes completely. So you just like that, go out and buy a skid steer with a mulcher and all of a sudden you're doing sewer and water. Well, it's useless it's to useless, you. Yeah. you know, speaking from experience, I bought a mulcher for one of my mini hose thinking, oh, we'll do lots of mulching. Things sat in the shop more than anything. Yeah. <laughs> Ended up selling it, right? Like, but yeah, that's 100% how it goes down. So I, I mean, personally even, believe you, you start with renting. I mean, yeah, you can even say the same for my business, right? Like I, I started my business thinking, oh, I'm going to do consulting. I'm going to buy and sell. And you know, then all of a sudden someone asks you, hey, can you rent a motor grader for a year? And then next thing you know, you've got 10 pieces of equipment and you're going, what the heck? Like, how did I get here? Um, so I think that's really important to kind of keep that as, you know, as you as a good example of like, Hey, this can change. Right. And to your point, right. You get on a different job site and someone pulls you over here to do a different type of work or whatever it might be. So I think having that, uh, flexibility with renting is, is huge. And, uh, so I guess to get back to the original question, I don't know that I would say there's a one, you know, uh, uh, a magic wand of this is the perfect, you know, thing to go out and buy. If you're a site work contractor, or you're trying to get started in site work. I think the important thing is, is, and I've seen other co companies do this as well is go get the work and, and rent the equipment, figure out what you're really good at and, and what work you make great money at and go do that and be really good at it. Right. Um, that's not always easy to do. Um, sometimes you got to have the equipment. I think there's this fear in the industry of, you know, well, if I don't have the equipment, I'm going to not look legit or whatever. Right. But uh, I think at the, in this day and age, I think people understand, right? The and biggest and, contractors in the world rent equipment. Absolutely, absolutely. Most of them do. Yep, yep. Very few massive companies own their entire fleet. Yeah, that's and the I, thing. And I think having that balance, right, um, between uh, some owned equipment, some rented equipment. I mean, here here we are, right? We're we, at least depending on which news station you listen to or on the heels of, you know, or getting ready to dive into a recession at some point, or that's what at least what everyone is telling us. So it's, it's kind of one of those things though, that if you have a lot of own fleet, you could be in a really bad situation, right? Especially if you've purchased equipment in 21 and 22 and you've paid outrageously high Top rates, dollar, high yeah. interest rates. Exactly. You got a high interest rate, you know, especially on the back end of 22, you got a high interest rate. You paid more for the piece of equipment than it's ever been worth. Um, and so now try to go and sell that, right. And try to go sell that when everyone else is trying to sell that exact same machine. Right. Yep. So it's, it's something that if it's a rented piece of equipment and maybe it's an RPO, right. That's why I, I think RPOs is a great way for a contractor to prove, make a business case. Like that's what I always tell customers is make a business case, right. Prove to yourself that you actually need that piece of equipment before you go invest 300, you know, quarter or half a million dollars into a piece of equipment. Why don't you break down an RPO for guys? Yeah. So, so those that don't understand or don't, haven't heard of it, our RPOs are rent purchase option. So essentially what that allows a, a contractor to do is uh, uh, rent a piece of equipment and apply some of that monthly rental towards the principal of the machine. Um, now there's two ways that contractors, you know, really look at that. Number one is you allow your job to expense the the cost of that machine, right? So that that job is paying for that machine. And then number two is now at the end of that, let's say, you know, just for round number's sake, we bought a two hundred thousand dollar machine and we've rented it for a full year and now we have a hundred thousand dollars left, right? Now you're financing a hundred thousand dollars versus the two hundred. Now you could look at it through the lens of, well, I paid that hundred thousand dollars earlier on this year but if you were going to be renting that machine anyways you you were going to pay that regardless right is there a set premium typically on top of your regular rental rate to go to an rpo um so most people do prime plus three percent for an interest rate that's i would say kind of industry standard as far as what we see um and then depending on the dealership some dealers are a little more uh like I don't know. I would say there's a little, there's some gimmicks to it, right? Mm -hmm. There are some dealers that play little games with it where, you know, if you pay cash for the machine today, it's, 
200,000, but if you RPO'd, it's 220,000. And then they're going to charge you interest as well. So it, you pay for that flexibility, right? But at the end of the day, if you've got 12 months and 100% applies or even six months, 100%, and then and, you know six months, 80% or 75%, you're paying for that flexibility to know, hey, if it's month eight, and I got to push the eject button because that job that I thought I was going to get, I didn't get, I can do that. Right. And yeah, or, why, or you started with a piece and you get three, four months in and realize it's too small, too big, not the right machine, don't not, like it. Not the right tool. You yeah. know, that's, that gives you a pretty good option to, to try it, work with it. Like you said, build the business case for yourself, see your numbers, your utilization, all that stuff. And then make the decision at that point for a real small price yep. that you're going to keep it or you're going to get rid of it. So yeah, I, I think, think it's a great option. Yeah, I agree. I think that it's um, it's it's a great way to uh, kind of prove it to yourself, right? Definitely. And, uh, that's that that is really important, especially as you're starting out. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying the episode. But I'd like to take a minute of your time to talk to you about today's sponsor. Are you a GIS professional, land surveyor, or construction professional looking for the best in surveying equipment, software, and service? Look no further than AGS Inc. AGS Inc. is an authorized dealer for Topcon and Sokia Surveying Equipment Dealer and EOS Aero Mapping Products Dealer. With a supply store in Grapevine, Texas to serve the DFW Metroplex, Central Texas Presence, and a corporate headquarters in Houston, Texas, H AGS has you covered. Stop by and experience the AGS Inc. difference today. At AGS, it is a service after the sale that counts. AGS is the proud sponsor of the On Grade Podcast. On grade podcast listeners, give these guys a call if you want to talk about bringing precision surveying, layout, drones, GPS, GIS, or 3D scanning spatial technologies to your company. Thank you and have a great evening. Back to the episode. I RPO'd <clears throat> my last four machines that I bought because I'm I was eager in the beginning and Pulled the trigger on machines and started buying machines, started buying machines. And I'm like, wow, I uh, probably should have RPO'd some of these because <laughs> I didn't have enough work yet. I thought I did, you know, six months of work. And then all of a sudden that six months is done and I'm going, well, we got this big excavator and we're going to do a Dairy Queen with a 350. Yeah. <laughs> 850. Yeah. That's that's pretty big iron to be doing a Dairy Queen with. It was pretty funny watching the GC's reaction pulling up to his job with a 850 and 350s like, you got anything smaller? Now we're going to be out of here in two days, dude. Yeah. We'll have to light down this thing on Wednesday. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, it's, um, it is humbling, you know, when you, when you guys, when, when you're starting a company up, you got to be humble about it. Yes. You see the big contractor out there with 657s doing that massive cut. And you see those guys rolling down the highway. They got 470s and they got off roads and they got D8s and 10s and all that. Those guys are probably 35, 40 year old companies, dude. I can guarantee you they started just the same way you did. A lot of them, they still got the original tractor out in front of their office. And if you look, it ain't that fancy. It's an open cab cat or old John Deere. So just be humble. You know, you got to be humble in this business. That's the one thing that people aren't in this business, take, though. I was take just getting ready ego to say. out of it. You know, yeah. That's the thing. There's no room in business for ego. Uh, ego. Can you guys business. say that again? Because I think there's more people that need to hear that. Because oh, honestly, ego. yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not saying that just to be facetious. I mean, in, in all seriousness, right? Like being humble in this business, I, I can't tell you how many people I come across are like, well, why'd you buy that? Oh, well, I wanted, I wanted to have a 365. Well, do you need a 365? Well, I needed it for one job. So why did you do it? And I mean, he, this guy that I'm talking about in particular, I mean, he admitted, he's like, yeah, I didn't need that. It was a complete waste, right? Our utilization is low on it. It's crazy that we ever bought it, but I wanted to have the biggest excavator in town and I've got it, right? And I'm like, yeah. Do you want that payment? Nope, not at all, <laughs> right? But well, but the, it's you get that ego gets in the way. And, and I think that's, you know, if you're using, if you're a utility contractor and you're going to buy, you know, a 350 size excavator and you can use it every single day, that's one thing, right? Like get after it. Um, but when you're just getting started out and you're trying to kind of find your way, you know, rent and yeah, are you paying a little bit of tuition with a higher rental rate? Absolutely. But what you've got to remember is, you know, and be humble about is I don't, I'm not saddled with this payment for years and years and years, right? And that's the important thing is, as you grow is knowing that, right? 
So the funniest thing is I did it wrong. Um, I have all the big iron. I own all the big iron. So I have to rent rollers and water trucks, like the stuff that costs nothing. <laughs> so it's it's funny because, like, you know, I call, you know, I use Sunbelt. I use whoever I use, you know, whatever strew of companies we Advanced use. Advanced track soon, hopefully. Yeah. Well, <laughs> um, and uh, of course, man, you know, sponsoring yeah. the show today. Yeah, I gotta get, I gotta get my plug in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just playing. Um, that's three three weeks of free rent, right? For yeah, sponsoring the show. <laughs> <laughs> we can, we'll talk about that when the cameras aren't rolling on, yeah. on a shovel. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Get you it's a, a gold, one. Yeah. It's one of them gold plated ones like they use in the pre, in the uh, groundbreaking ceremonies. Yeah. Well, our three weeks, you, know, you get one hour a day, so yeah, yeah, yeah we can work yeah, something yeah, out. Yeah. 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 That hour you're shutting down at five thirty. Yeah. yeah. So we'll cover you at six thirty. Yep. No. Um. The funniest thing. Um, is that I do have to do that though because I started in the completely wrong direction that you guys are talking about. Because my first company that I had with my partners, we had all small equipment because we were doing small work and we grew to big work, but I was renting the big stuff for the big work. I wasn't buying anything, I was just renting it and I never did. And then, you know, they those guys kept on doing their thing and I stayed, I left and went on my own. And it was so funny because contacts I had developed for my old company called me and they didn't want to deal with those guys anymore. And they was like, hey, we got a couple of jobs. I heard you're going out on your own. I said, yeah. Well, they're, you know, 10,000 square foot building pads right off the bat. I mean, eight, nine foot of MC, you know. I'm like, yeah, I can't do that with like a D4 and a 312, man. I need a. I need like a 320 at least and a 750. So there we go. You know, we start with the 750 and 320. And next thing I know, I've got 350s, 850s, 963, motor graders. I'm like, what just happened, dude? We went from yeah. zero to 100 like that. Yeah. But the cash flow didn't go with it. Yeah. That's the thing that we got to talk about. As you're growing these companies, that's why you rent. Yeah. Because that's going to show you a rough idea of what you're going to pay a month. For that machine yes when you finance if you can finance it a little longer you're you're not going to pay as much but still you know uh 963 rental is what 9500 bucks a month on average you buy it through cat when i bought mine of course i was a zero percent guy like you're talking about yeah i don't pay that i pay like 6300 bucks but when i was renting it i was paying that and I can make that payment. So I went, okay, well, I can afford to buy this machine because I'm still justifying that payment. But I'm saving three grand a month getting the same utilization out of that machine. So it was a no brainer. Yeah. And all of us do that, but we don't factor in the cost of ownership too. So the maintenance, all of the stuff that comes along with owning that piece, you know, it's not three grand a month, but there definitely is a number that gets attributed to that. So you're when you're doing the dumb math of, oh, it's nine grand to rent it, it's six grand to buy it, let's save three grand. Well, when you actually break it down, it's not quite like that. When you end up looking at the maintenance, the long-term cost of owning that piece of equipment, you're going to have other costs associated with it that you don't have with a rental. Track breaks on the rental unit, take it back. Call, the rental call them up. They're yeah. going to come fix it. You know, Blow a hydraulic hose, come fix it. Cylinder gets messed up, come fix it. Those are costs that aren't coming out of your pocket when you're renting. When you own it, you own it. Well, and that's where, as a as a good owner, you sit down and do the numbers. And I was going to caveat of what you just said that, you know, you don't save that three grand. Well, actually, if you do it correctly, and my man over here might agree with me on this one, if you finance in the deal thirty six months, forty eight months, whatever it is, maintenance and motor to frame front to rear warranty on that thing. You break a track, they're coming out and fixing it for free. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. now is it getting tacked into your payment? Yeah, oh hell yeah, they're getting their money up front. They're getting their money up front before they even come out and fix it. But you have that knowing that if they don't fix it in twenty four hours, you are getting a loaner machine until it is fixed. Yeah. Yeah. And I I'm think gonna tell y'all, when I did that with my machines, you know, all mine are done now, the thirty six months are done. And miraculously, they all started breaking down after that thirty six <laughs> yeah. months. And I paid all that money in. Oh, they got me. Yeah. But, you know, it's funny because you sit there and you're like, <clears throat> well, I got this deal. I'm going to trade them in in three years. What happened in three years? COVID. Iron's three times the money it was in 2019. 
I got a quote. I talked about it last episode. You remember? I got a quote for two D6s. I don't know. It was mid-2019. Mm, I think for two of them, it was $600,000. <laughs> That's with the GPS. That was with everything. That was installed with with a 36-month lube, full bumper to bumper on it. And it was my payments were going to be like nine or ten grand. And then I call them last year. I said, hey, dude, you know, that 850 is getting up on them hours. I'm going to trade and get a six. So he goes out, looks at the machine. He's like, yeah, well, I can give you this for it. You know, it's a little more than, you know, we had some equity in it. I said, okay. I said, well, what are we looking at for, for that machine? He sends me back the quote, and it was the cost of the two machines. I literally still had the quote from 19. And I jokingly sent it back to him. I said, so you guys can still honor this price, right? <laughs> <laughs> What's really cool about what you just said, though, it, and it, I think a lot of contractors, um, I, well, I don't want to, I'm not going to pull everyone together. But what I will say is that people look at equipment management so differently, right? Like you can go out there and see guys that run old gear, but they've got great mechanics. They've got a great service program. They've got a great, you know, maintenance program. So they are tackling that the best way that they see fit. Right. And they're not, they don't have a bunch of payments, but they're making, you know, they're paying a lot for their trucks rolling down the road. They're paying a lot for their mechanics and, you know, parts, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And then you got guys who, you know, they run mixed fleets, right? And they've got a little bit of everything, some old, some new, and they make it work and they're really profitable that way. And then you see other guys who they go out, they lease every three years, they build in that maintenance and repair right into their contract. So that just like to your point, they don't ever have to think about what their cost is because their cost is whatever their payment is every month, mm -hmm. right? And so it's as close as you can get to fixing that number for you, right? To where mm -hmm. it's a it's a it's a flat rate, and now you know that rate. And what's what's really cool is when you can take that payment, whatever it is, and you can now compare it to that rental rate more accurately, right? And then the other side of that is now you can start measuring your utilization off of it. So if you've got a three-year lease, right, and you know what that payment's going to be, or a four-year lease, let's say, and you know what that payment's going to be, and you know how many hours you think you're going to put on it, now start watching how many hours you are putting on it. Mm -hmm. Because if you're not putting 60 70% uh, of utilization on that machine annually, and everyone thinks like, oh, well, there's 2,080 hour working hours in a year, right? That's, that's the number. That's 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year, right? That's the number, 2,080. I'm going to put 2,100 hours on this machine. I mean, I, I manage the fleet over at Moss and we look at this stuff all the time. And some of our assets, we put 2,500 hours on a year. Some of our assets that we think we're going to put 2,000 hours on, we put 1,000 hours on over the course of a year. So that's when you have to start looking at it and go, okay, I'm not getting 60 to 70%. And the break-evens are different on every single piece of equipment, but I'm not getting that utilization that I need. So now what do I do, right? And that's going back to your point of, Maybe it makes more sense to rent this asset when I do need it and have it available through, you know, several vendor relationships than for me to own it, right? Or for me to lease it and pay this money that I'm going to pay, I'm paying regardless, yep. right? If that machine's working this month or it's sitting on a job, I'm still got that payment that's coming through the door, right? So I think that's a good way of, of looking at it. I think that, um, you know, I, I, I know Komatsu calls it total maintenance and repair and I forget what cat calls it, but I know every single one has got a different slogan for it. But when you can wrap those expenses up in your note, um, you know, and get it close to a fixed cost, it's, it's pretty dang helpful for a contractor as you're bidding work too, right? Well, you to can know. budget, you can get your margins way easier. Yeah. It's just way simpler than trying Absolutely. To, to figure it out. Yep. So yes. When, yeah. When we got done with our uh, three year maintenance note, I had to start putting EOE in, you know, for, yeah an hourly rate and i never messed with it before because it always has machines that like we're talking about so i actually had to call caterpillar and john deere and they guy ballparked me told me what a good hourly rate would be so if you have like say a 850l right um a undercarriage on that will run you between 25 20 to twenty five thousand to replace right and you know that's going to go out roughly at if about five thousand hours Right. If you're running it right, you're keeping the track maintained correctly. You're not tightening it too much. It's not too loose. Your undercarriage and your rails, you're going to have to change out roughly 5,000 hours. So 
I you got to think. Do you want to pony all that money up at once? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or do you want that machine to accrue that capital for you so when it does come time, you can pay for it? Yeah. Because so I was putting we we're running roughly about $3 an hour, which doesn't sound like a whole lot. But that one time it breaks down and you got to replace a track or you've got to, you know, you've got to change out sensors or something like that. And it's not on warranty anymore. And you got to go and pay for it yourself. And you got to pay a mechanic, come out of there and fix it. And he's charging you 150 bucks an hour to sit out there in his truck. You know, that EOE adds up, man. If you're sitting there running for five, seven, five, six months, you don't have any issues. That EOE is paying for it. Now, something that a lot of people don't do is they don't think about this. They don't put their services into their hourly rates. Yeah. You need to put your services in there. So if you're going to be doing every 500 hours, which most people do the 500, I know you do 250, but some people, the bigger machines, you can get away with the 500. Like skids and stuff, uh, yeah, I'd do 250, but our skids, we do 250. And pretty much everything else we're running 500 hour services on, but you know, we do filters, we do oil change, we do all hydraulic fluid change, everything, every 500. Um, but what my point to that was is you have to figure that into your hourly rate too, covering the cost of doing that because, you know, everybody's like, oh, that should be included in your hourly. It shouldn't, that's an outside expense. No, you still should still be charging for that because that's maintenance you have to do on your machine to be on their job site. Yeah. So, Everything you do on that job has an expense. That's the thing. Like people that I've heard this year, you have too. I'm sure you have as well. I've had people tell me, you're not supposed to be able to charge to have a grade check around a job site before. I've had general contractors tell me that. I'm like, who's going to set your stakes, bro? Like, yeah. <laughs> like yeah. who, who's going to get your GPS work and, and check all your control points and make sure they're working? Yeah, you got to charge for that guy. The guy sitting in the pickup running the job, you're charging for that guy sitting in the pickup running the job. Yeah. In the pickup. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you got to, man. Like, it's crazy that people don't know how to estimate this stuff. And, well, and uh, we actually have uh, we actually have a bunch of people been saying that on the comments and stuff on Spotify and on TikTok and stuff, they've been saying, hey, we'd love to see episodes about, you know, estimating and stuff. And... The thing that I want to talk most about is though, is this is the biggest part of that estimating portion. You can know quantities all day, but you don't know what it costs you an hour to run that machine with an operator in it. Fuel, def, grease, overhead, and EOE maintenance and profit. Then don't you need to you need to call somebody because good or, a good rental rep's going to tell you. He's going to call you, you call him up, and he'll send you what's called a rate sheet. And he'll send you that rate sheet. And what you do is you they're going to give you, okay, if you need to rent, say you got a job coming up, you need to rent a D6T. He's going to give you the rate sheet for that machine. That's before tax, though. So then you got to ask him, hey, what's the herp tax on this? What's this? And he'll, and mo- if you got a good salesman, he's going to send you that in a quote sheet. Yeah. It has it, the whole thing broke down. That's it, getting mowed, demowed, everything. Then yeah, we gotta, charge like... Yeah. You have terp tax, you got inventory tax, and sales tax. And you I'll tell you all the biggest everything. trick of this is get you an Excel spreadsheet, literally. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blow everybody's mind here. Put that number in the left corner. Put your guy's hourly rate, what you're paying him an hour right here. Plus Put, the cost of paying him too. Yeah. yeah. Put his overtime in there. Put your EOE in there. Because you might have to fix something. They can't get out there and fix it. So you might have to change a hose out for them or – Hey, can you just cover this and I'll knock it off your rent? I've had that happen plenty of times. Hey, yeah, can you absolutely. just cover this tire, dude? Because I can't get out there today. So call Mid- Midwest Tire. They come out and change the tire. I pay them and they knock it off my rent. But, you know, it's little things like that you do. So, <clears throat> but I'll get back to my Excel real quick. You put your hourly rate for your guy, all that stuff, and then you put in there overhead of 20% minimum. You got to have 20% in there for your overhead. A lot of people have this misconception that you need 10% in hourly rate on a machine. It's like, well, if you want to eat ramen for the rest of your life with a little bit of ranch on top of it, that you might be able to get the powdered ranch somewhere at a grocery store. Sure, go ahead. Put 20 on it, man. 
Now, <clears throat> profit, that's the <laughs> that's the <laughs> that's the fun one to sneak in there because it's it's always fun to do. But if you're running like I, I know you guys over at Moss are running the estimating software like where we are, you know, where it calculates pretty much everything for you as long as you put the hourly rate in correctly and all that. But the thing is you have to figure out that hourly rate before yeah. you input it into your software. So this is where the Excel comes in of okay. Well, this is what I need to charge an hour. Like me and him, I did, we're doing work together. And I called him. I said, hey, what do, you, what do you need me to be at? He goes, what do you mean? I says, what do you need me to be at? And he says, what, you got that much wiggle room with your hour there? Yeah. Why? <laughs> well, I've got people I like, yeah. people I don't like, people I really don't like. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Not I mean, really, but. <laughs> no, I mean, you want to be honest with you. I got a client that's a pain in the royal. You know what? He's on the top. Yeah. Hey, uh, we do the same thing in the rental business, right? I mean, it's like, yeah. oh, you don't, you pay me every 90 days? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. My rates book rate. Yeah. Oh, you want a discount? I'm sorry. That's cool. Go find someone that'll discount it to you. And then they're going to discount it to you until you don't pay them for 90 days. And then what? Right. And that's, this is, you know, it's just the way the business works. Right. Yeah. I and mean, that's not even being a dick. That's just covering your cost. You know, yeah. you got to carry that note for three months. You're paying interest on that. Exactly. You know, exactly. Or you, sh- you should be getting interest for that mo- money being out. So you factor that in there. Yeah. The whole, the whole system's kind of is flawed, man. It's, it's, it absolutely is. It really, really needs to change. And, uh, you know, I know we're talking about equipment on this episode and trying to help people out, but at the end of the day, this is the business and we need to talk about the business and, as an industry, we have a problem. Yes, we have employee shortages. We have all this stuff. But they kind of at the Con Expo this year showed that this problem might get solved pretty soon with this automated equipment. Um, the saddest part about it is is there's a lot of guys. There's five, six generations of guys though that have been operators. And that might start taking people away from machines. Yeah, you're going to have some guys that are sitting in the office monitoring them and running them and stuff through satellite, but they're not going to be sitting on job sites anymore. I yeah. mean, the guy that was running that one machine, I think, was sitting in, like, New Mexico or something, wasn't he? Yeah, I yeah. saw that. I mean, it's insane. It is, yeah. I think that uh, – I think you're definitely right. I think there's – we've we've definitely – that employee shortage component is is a big component of it, but there's a lot of other stuff that goes along with it, and – you know, getting paid, getting paid timely is a, is a huge component as well. And it's, you know, um, it's something that, especially as a rental guy, right? Like, I mean, you guys have payments to make, right? You've got truck payments, you've got equipment payments, you've got fuel, you've got material, you've got payroll, you've got all these things, right? And then somewhere down here is the, is the rental company, right? And I get it, right? I get that you guys are in that position. I'm in the same position, right? I know the vendors that I can stretch and I know the vendors I can't, right? Um, and that's business, right? And I'd, I'd love to pay everyone every 30 days, um, like we've all agreed to, right? When we've signed these credit apps and do all this stuff. But business isn't always perfect. And, uh, and I think that's when communication really is, is such a huge component, right? I've got three guys who haven't paid me right now and they don't return texts. They don't return phone calls. They don't return emails. Right. And it's, Hey, let's, let's just talk about it. What do you need? Can you, can you pay 500 bucks a week until it's covered? Can you pay 500 bucks a month until it's covered? Can you, you know, what's, what can we do right before I have to go force my hand and, or force your hand and lean the job or do something like that, which no one likes to see. Um, it's, it's something that it's just, it's an unfortunate aspect of the business. And and it is, it seems flawed. It's like, how do we, how do we fix that to where, you know, the GCs understand that the developers understand. I think I had lunch with a GC a couple of weeks ago and he made a, he made a comment to me that I thought there's really stuck out in my head about liens because liens I've always looked at them like, well, this is how me as a vendor, I protect myself on a job. Right. And he goes, yeah, but you're using my credit completely unagreed to. And I was like, oh, that, I never thought of it that way, but you are right. Like I'm essentially saying, Hey, if you're the GC, you're on the hook for this payment, right? Or if you're the developer or the owner, ultimately somewhere along that chain, someone's going to be responsible for that payment, oh, 100%. even though it's your subcontractor or a, or a general contractor's subcontractor, subcontractor that rented the piece of equipment. Right. And I never really thought of it that way. And when I did, I was like, that just, brings up the point that this is a, such a flawed system, right? It is. And then, I mean, 
the thought behind the lean process is the idea of it is great in the sense that the purpose of the lean would be for if the sub didn't get paid from the GC, you're leaning the job. If the sub got paid and then didn't pay the bill, well, then that's a completely different story, and that's exactly yeah. what the GC is talking about. But if the sub didn't get paid and can't pay you, then you're putting pressure on the GC to kick that money down. And it's kind of a twofold. You have problems both sides of that, you know, and there's situations in both ways. But when you have long pay terms, you know, when you're, you're doing a job, net 45, net 60 on jobs, why is it a net 45 and net 60 on the job? Yeah. You want to build something, you have the money to do it. You're going yeah. to the bank to get the money to do it. If you're not budgeting the project properly to be able to pay on time, why is it being done? You know, and that's, it's kind of starts at the top. I mean, you always have problems in the middle and, and everything sure. else, but at the end of the day, why are contractors financing projects for 45 days for a GC? It makes no sense. Yeah. Well, we were you talking know. about it the other day, you and me on the phone. I mean, you know, I mean, I got a job right now that, you know, from two years ago, I finally just got the bonding check for it. The GC went out of business. I mean, it's insane. Yep. And, you know, and the worst part is the suppliers I used, I've used them for years. Never had had an issue before. It's a half a million dollar job. We almost finished it. We didn't get paid a cent, you know, because we went in there and we busted butt and we got major. you know this, we got majority of the work done in 60 days. That's about the time you're thinking you're going to get your first draw. So you're just blowing and going, just blowing and going. And what happened? No money. And then day 91, pulled the iron off the job, slapped a lean on it. Two years later, they called me. Oh, we're going to finally get you paid on that job. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, I got people threatening me because it's my fault because I asked them to do the work for me on that job, and I can't pay them. Mm-hmm. I mean, did I attempt to make it right? Yeah. But, I mean, that's the thing that they they don't realize. You're You're asking people who have massive expenses on top of your expenses – to cover your own expenses, man. Like it's not right. Like, yeah, this, especially excavation, you know, underground utilities, the rental businesses, we're talking about huge capital expenses, mm-hmm. right? Huge capital outlays, <laughs> not just in, not just in the, the equipment capital, but human capital as well. Right. I mean, you've got payroll of all these guys sitting on this job. Like how, how are you supposed to make payroll? Right. And then for some guys, that $500,000 job, that would have broke them. Right. Their, their job would, or their business would fold up because they don't have the sticking power to be able to line up another job that will pay to, to cover the shorts of this one. Right. I mean, it's, it's really an unfortunate, uh, situation that people can just walk away like that. Right. And I mean, you see, unfortunately you see it all the time though. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and it affects everyone down the line. Right. Yep. Ultimately it's one of those things that as great as it would be to change it, I don't see it changing anytime soon. There's just so many, you know, 10 of us could get together and say, okay, we're not doing any jobs until we're paid up front. We're getting weekly billing, you know, whatever you want to do. There's always going to be someone else that's going to come in and, and do the long term and do the, you know, the job with the hope of getting paid. And it just kind of erodes the whole system. You're undermining everybody else and doing it. It's been that way for so long. I feel like it's hard to see that changing anytime soon. But I mean, ultimately like, your best insurance against that is knowing your numbers, knowing your your costs, having your margin set right, billing properly, and charging enough to do the job. You, and knowing you gotta who be, you're working for. Yeah. yeah. you got to be making enough profit in your business to know that in the back of your head, you're probably going to get burnt once or twice on these jobs. you got to make enough money up, t- up front and ahead of time to be able to weather that and to go through it. And that's exactly what you're saying. You know, Somebody gets burned for half a million dollars. If they're a small company or they're a company that's not charging adequately for what they're doing, they don't have the cash flow or the capital no. to be able to weather that, take that hit. You know, and as shitty as it is that you have to plan for that, it's part of the business, unfortunately. And you do have to plan for that. And that really comes down to to knowing your numbers and then charging a fair price, you know, and charging adequately to do what it is that you're doing. And a lot of people, this whole business is always shopped on price. You bid a job, you bid a job, low bid, low bid, low bid, low bid. Ultimately, you're racing to the bottom. The whole industry is racing to the bottom, you know, continuously until someone says, okay, I'm not going any lower. This is it. You know, when you turn the job down, you get refused. You don't take that job. 
if you keep asking your price, eventually you'll find someone who's going to pay it. And you keep working for those people that are going to pay on time. They're going to pay quick and they're going to pay what you're worth to do it. But that's part of the businesses. When you're starting out, it's hard. You want to take every job because you want to make money. You want to get going. Once you get in business a while and you start realizing like, shit, I'm doing all this work, but I got no money because you're blowing it up the door just as fast. That's when you got to realize you got to start putting your rights up, increase your price, and you're going to lose customers. You're going to lose jobs. You're not going to get every job you bid because you're charging more and you need to charge more. You'll still have customers. There's always going to be people that are going to be willing to pay what it is that you're worth to do it within reason. I mean, but if you're good at what you do and you do a great job and you develop or deliver a great service, you're always going to be able to find people that are going to pay the fair price for your product. But that's part of being in business and gaining experience, you know, and I'm sure you see it in the rental industry, you know? Yeah. Big time. You set your margin. This is what it is. I'm not going below this, you know, and if it's too much for you, find somebody else. Yeah. We certainly see that. Right. And, and to your point, I mean, rentals to a degree have become a commodity, right? It's like, Hey, this is just, it's just like, where are you going to buy rock from? It's just like, where am I buying pipe from or whatever it is that you're buying. Right. And, uh, and, and there's not a lot of communication amongst the rental industry, like in, in specific areas. And, you know, there's great organizations like the ARA and, 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 um, you know, the IEDA and other, uh, organizations that kind of, you, you know, help bring together equipment dealerships. But at the end of the day, what we do, uh, you know, with heavier equipment rentals, like it's, it's, it's pretty specific, right? So I may go sit in a room with folks that are renting, you know, party tents and, and stuff like that. Right. But at, at the end of the day, what you start to see is that there's not a lot of communication between us. Right. So when we talk about, um, like to your point, talking about the 963 and the rental rate on that, right? Well, yeah, you may find that the standard or, you know, the going rates, 9,500, 10 grand a month, whatever it might be. But the re- the reality is it's going to be whatever the market can bear. And, and the problem that we have is that we don't all communicate, right? So there's no standardization of rates. And I guess, you know, in a, a free market society, you want that, right? You want that, that flexibility for someone to come in and, and figure out how to do it cheaper. And then you sell that value. Right. Um, and it's, it, it's just becoming more and more challenging to, to do that. Right. And, and it, it has become a race to the bottom. And, you know, I, I talked a little bit earlier about how, when I first got going, it was a lot of smaller equipment, right? And the skids and minis and whatnot. And, uh, and as you're getting going with those pieces of equipment, you just come to find out that United can rent them for way less than you can. Well, why is that? Well, because they have a national agreement with John Deere and they just are talking to you or whoever 10 or $15,000 exactly, less per piece. Exactly. Right. And then I'm over here buying onesie twosies at, at Holt. Right. And I'm, you know, it's, it's a, it's a much different story. Right. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that's true with any business, right? Is that it, it, you really, what are you going to sell? Right. And a lot of people sell bottom dollar, right? And a lot of people sell top dollar and they're, they offer a premium product, right? And then there's guys in the middle who have, you know, a, a, a value proposition, right? That like, Hey, we're not going to be the cheapest. We're not going to be the most expensive, but you're going to get what we say. And, and, and you're going to, you know, we're going to do the best job that we can. Right. And I think, um, to your point, not sacrificing, right. Or not compromising, not sacrificing, but not compromising on the, on that is, is huge. And that's how you're going to find those great customers and, and find those, you know, the, whether it's a great general contractor or whether it's, you know, me renting to one of you guys, right. Or, or whoever it is, but finding the, that those customers that are your ideal customer and really targeting that and building your business on those folks. hundred percent. You know, I think it's funny. Like, um, we talk about like rewards programs a lot, right? Like, uh, in the rental business, we, it, it's most natural for a rental company to cut their rate for a first time customer to try to get them in the door. Right. Whereas like you have to earn that status. Like you don't become a frequent flyer on American and get, you know, platinum honors, whatever the heck it's called. Right. You don't get that status until you've used until them. you've used them built until the you've built the relationship. Exactly. Right. Yep. But in this industry, it's like, I've never used you before, but you're the cheapest. So I'm going with you. Right. <laughs> like how does that feel as a, con- as a, you know, an excavation site work contractor to go, okay, I'm, I'm not the cheapest, but I've done other jobs for you before, you know, the product that we deliver, but you're not going to use me because I'm not the cheapest. Mm-hmm. Right. It's like, where, how do we, how do we there's, value this? There's no loyalty in this business anymore. You know, 20 years ago, you'd have the same guy working for the same GC for 15 years. 
you know, they'd go, I have this handful of guys that I use. And, you know, it was whoever it was. Sure. You know, they use those guys. And then the workload crew. And then more and more and more and more and more contractors. And when you're in an area like we are in, where you're saturated with contractors, you are killing yourself. We got no way to point the finger at but ourselves. I mean, we're doing it to ourselves because four or five of us will be, you know, you hear this. I know you hear this one on the phone. I know you do too. Yeah, man. You and this guy and this guy, you guys are within like two or three grand of each other. But man, we got this one guy that just sent us a bid. He's yeah. like a hundred grand cheaper than y'all. What's the name of the company? And that's the first question every time you go, oh, Johnson Dirt Services. And then you go, oh. <laughs> and a month later, they're calling you. Can hey, you come dude, finish this job? Dude, dude, I can't get this guy to come back out here. He says he won't finish it because I can't pay him yet. And he's like, no, 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 I'm not doing it. Blah, blah, blah. I got liens flying on this job. Blah, blah, blah. It's like, well. Get what you pay for. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, it, it's sad, but it, that is the truth. That's really what causes a lot of the problems is ourselves. I mean, is the industry itself is it's the whole culture is just wrong. Yeah. I mean, we, we, I can say the same thing about the rental business, right? I mean, it's, it's other rental companies that are willing to cut rate mm -hmm. to such a cheap price where, I, and, and, and some of these guys, like they rent, similar equipment right i mean whether it's a, a main you know a, i would say like one of the big four brands or whether it's a saney right and it, and you know that if it's a different brand right the cost difference is substantial right mm -hmm. i mean that if you're jumping from and i'm not trying to trash other brands like at the end of the day there's every every brand has its place and there's a lot of brand loyalty and so forth but my point is is that there's guys that spend a premium on the equipment and they go and they cut their rate just into these insane places where you're, I'm sitting there going, there's no way, like I can't make that work. Right. Um, and, and, and again, kind of back to the fact that we don't communicate to really talk about and say, Hey, like we need to like, not go, this is going to be better for all of us. Right. It's going to be better for all of us. Right. Um, it's almost like we, it's not like we need to unionize, but it's almost like we do. Yeah, it, it's terrible to say these words. I'm I'm the most non-union guy pick, you'll ever meet. Pick a different word. <laughs> pick a different word. You know yeah. what I'm saying though. Like, and, yeah, no do. offense to anybody that's listening to the show that is in the union. Kudos to you, man. I, I just I don't believe in it. I'm not going to pay to have a job. But the the thing is, maybe that is what we need to do. Is you know they they've got you know the employees themselves have all these choices, but as companies. We don't, yeah. you know, as company leadership, we don't have that option. We don't have the, oh, well, you know, they're guaranteed this, they're guaranteed that. We're not guaranteed anything. You sign a contract, that's all you got. Yeah. And you'd, you'd good, probably know this. Good luck holding it up in court half the time because half the time the shit well, they wrote in the contract don't. They, they and, won't honor it anyways. And it and it's it doesn't matter how bulletproof your contract is, oh, right? I mean, no. you can have the most bulletproof contract, yeah. right? That at the end of the day, now you're going to spend attorney's fees fighting that, even yeah. if you're totally in the right, right? I mean, one of the guys that owes me money, I've filed a small claim suit against, right? And the judge sits there. The guy didn't show up to deal, right? So by default, I get I get awarded the, the judgment, right? But he's reading through the contract. He's like, this is, I mean, this is bulletproof, right? And I'm like, yeah. But I've also had to pay money to be here. I've also had to pay a private investigator to investigate this situation. I mean, it is a mess, right? And and at the end of the day, it's like I've still spent all this money. For no gain. Exactly. <laughs> Can't get blood from a stone. Exactly. And that that to me is, I mean, it, it's, and I, I get there's just dirt bags out there too, right? And there's going to be people who take advantage of situations and so forth. And I get that, uh, you know, and you got to watch out for them. And, and I think. Back to your point, you have to understand that some of this is like the, it's the cost of doing business, right? And I think one area where just as business owners and honestly in life, just in general as humans, we we consume, right? It's like if we get a uh, $10,000 check for whatever it is that we did, we spend $10,000, right? <laughs> when, when you start talking about how, hey, I got a budget for these tracks that I need to replace on this 850L and I've got a budget for the PMs that I need to do on it and I've got a budget for you know all these added expenses, right? If you're not setting aside that cash, 
what good is it that you budgeted for that, right? Because at the end of the day, if you if come time to replace the tracks, if you can't write that twenty five thousand dollar check, you ain't getting them. You ain't getting the tracks. <laughs> exactly. Well, I mean, it's just well, it's so stupid, man. Like I tell people all the time, if people would just pay you, like every other industry pays each other. Think about it. So my friend is uh, in IT, and I, I'm from the IT background. You, you know, I told you about this. The way IT works is they'll quote a job. They're going to come in and they're going to build a server or farm or whatever they're going to build for, like the, the, the earthwork and stuff. Stuff. I'm not talking about doing civil portion of it, but they're going to come in and put the actual servers in. And they go, okay, hey, uh, we're going to install these servers. You know, it'll be 150000 in labor. And they, they have a breakout sheet. It's not like how we bid, but it'll be a breakout of all these things. And they have their profit just listed. Nobody gives a shit. No one does. Because everybody over there, there's like five of them that do it. So they all charge about the same amount of money. Yeah. They get 25% up front. And they get paid weekly. And there's no, well, we got to wait for the inspector to come out here. No, no, no. Listen, buddy. It's already installed. Pay. They don't have cash flow issues. So explain to me. I deal with the bank all the time. You deal with the bank all the time. You deal with the bank all the time. <laughs> I'm in the bank the other day and I'm talking to my banker because I'm trying to get a line of credit. And I go, so uh, when you guys uh, do construction loans, how quick do you guys pay them? Oh, between seven to ten days after the draw date. I'm, really? So where's the, where's that money then? So, you know, you always hear this. I'm sure you two have heard this as well. Oh, the money's in escrow. Mm -hmm. So that's why it still takes 60 days to get paid because it's in escrow. You can pull money out of an escrow account in two days. That's about that long it takes to get it pulled out of an escrow account. So where's the money sitting between there and here? Because two and a half months later, I'm begging someone and it's always the same shit oh well you you didn't you you, you forgot to initial this one spot on your <laughs> on your sheet so your can you send that back oh by the way i'm going to hawaii next week so i won't be here so i can't write your check and they do it with a straight fucking face dude like and i'm like you have no expenses dude you've got a two guys sitting on your job site in a fucking air-conditioned trailer that's your expenses and maybe the security fence you got up around the fucking thing. Pay your fucking bill. Yeah. And then I got, you know, I got my rental guys hounding me. I got my suppliers hounding me. And it's like, guys, I can't pay yeah. you if I'm not paid. And it's like, and the worst part is, if you have one guy not pay you on time, it screws the whole thing up. It's never, you can't ever just have one guy that's like, oh, okay. You know, that's that's fine. You know, well, just get me next month. No. Yeah. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it is crazy though, right? I mean, I mean that that's true, how though. we, yeah, it is. And, and it's hard because as a rental business, right, I, I could easily sit here and be like, well, I didn't make an agreement to do the job, right? I made mm -hmm. an agreement to provide you equipment and I provided, I held up my end of the bargain, right? So I'm owed my money, right? Um, and so it's easy to put your foot down and be that way, right? But then the way I look at it, and, and then I know people will sit here and be like, dude, you're soft, right? Like you're, you need to be, you need to be getting your cash, right? A pay up sucker type of mentality, right? But the reality is, is I feel like, well, I also understand the position y'all are in, right? Because I've been on that side of the, the 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 seat as well, right, or that side of the desk as well, and so I understand that if you you legitimately didn't get paid, then you legitimately can't pay me, right? So then we start talking about liens. Well, like let's go after the contractor, right? Like I'm helping you too, like force yep. their hand, right? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of guys freak out because they think that uh, hey, no liens, right? You're gonna you're pushing me into a position where I'm going to be in bad favor with this GC or with this developer. And I can't have that blah, blah, blah. You don't want to work for them if they're not paying you. Absolutely. Se they Secondly, dude, if you, if you work for a good developer and he gets a lien, he ain't calling the GC. No, he's going to call the guys that are listed on that, on that. Yeah. On the notice. And I've had it happen several times. Hey man, how you doing? I'm blah, blah, blah from development company, blah, blah, blah. You haven't been paid yet? No. Well, I've sent them three checks already. Yeah. Oh, really? That's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Can you send that to me in an email? Yeah. You know, and 
But the thing is, and, and something that you know this now, being on this side of the fence too, with us, the other problem you have is, and this is the problem that I'm still in, is you, you finally get on with good GCs where you are getting paid in such a timely manner and you're getting paid right. But the problem is you got so much shit behind you still from shit that you didn't get paid on, and but you got to still pay the bill. Yeah. So you're trying to divvy money yeah. out Yeah. to, you know, you got 700 grand worth of bills, but you're only making 500 grand this month. So you're like, hey, I'll throw you 50. That keep you happy for the month? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, and you're doing, you're doing what you can, you know. But communication is what you're but doing you, that a lot of guys don't. Right. Right. But and, then you're you're going, okay, well, this month I'm going to skip my cat payment. Well, that's going to fuck you with cat because guess what? You need to buy an excavator next year. Yeah. And they're going to go, this ain't 0% interest time anymore, buddy. And uh, it's 2023. It ain't 2020 or 2019. Yeah, we just ain't throwing machines out at you anymore. Uh, we tightened the belt. So uh, you missed one payment last year. And you were late 30 days, so uh, you have to put a lot more money down if you want this machine. And you don't think about that. You know, you think, oh, well, man, I've been running with Cat for five, six years, never had an issue. I'm late one time. They don't give a shit, dude. Yeah. You screw up, you know, you don't pay your guys. See, I may show up on Monday. <laughs> I mean, it's true, though. Like, it's... A hundred percent. Dude. It's a hundred percent. It's a struggle, man. And, yeah. like, the saddest part is... Why in this industry should you have to go get a line of credit? You already have credit with everything else. Why do you need to get a line of credit on top of that for 30 days? You have credit. So that you can pay your bills. <laughs> exactly. So you can pay the bills yep. off their job. Yep. So, yeah, so you can continue to finance that that guy's job. I yeah. want to make signs for my equipment that says this job is financed by and put <laughs> Iron Eagle excavation on the side of it. Yeah. I'm not even kidding. I've done it so I've thought it and I've had people die. I'm like, dude, I want to get a sticker made and put it on my hard hat that says that and just go to a pre con with it on. Everybody be like, What's that about? Yeah. Oh, I'm gonna find Let me tell you. Yeah. Yeah, it's gonna be forty five days out here before I even see a freaking dime, dude. So and you know, you know what, you know something that you probably notice it too, and I know you know this. They hate it when you get on the job about the twentieth of the month. Cause you're not gonna be out there that long and you're gonna get some money. So, you know, you get that huge, mo you know, everybody front loads the job. You, know, you put a shitload of money in your mobilization. You hit them up with that money and they're like, we ain't that much work done. Doesn't matter. That's a line item, bro. You pay by line item. So guess what? That's cool. You're still going to pay this. Yeah. And they hate it because they want to get you out there beginning of the month so they can, you know what they're doing. They're trying to get as much out of you as they can but and not front the bill. But if you can front load them, dude. Yeah. What are they gonna do to you? I mean, it's just like we talked about when we were up there at the the uh, uh, money, the uh, the thing they put on. Oh yeah, that? Scott Peeper. Yeah, it was Scott Peeper yeah. and those guys. They were talking. They were talking about. Garrett even brought it up. He's like, "Dude, front load the hell out of that mobilization, dude. That's how you get your money. Because yeah. if you, that's how you cash flow a job. Because yeah. then you got a bunch of money sitting there. You know, a lot of guys they just they actually charge what it costs to mobilize. They're like, oh well, I got you know twelve machines to bring it out here. It's a thousand bucks a machine. You know, yeah. you're gonna unload them. Oh, I'll charge you twelve grand, man. Fuck that shit. Multiply it by three, dude. Thirty six thousand. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Take your money out of the other one. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Get some fucking capital in there, man. You know, cover some payrolls with that mode, man. You know, it's like. Yeah, I started on. Bill. I I started in the construction world on uh, public workshops, right? And so you'd always balance the bit, right? You'd yeah. always like look at different line items and understand, like, okay, we think this quantity is going to underrun, so we're going to, you know, jack the price up, or we're going to yeah. lower the price, you know, based on whatever you see in the bids and the, or in the plans and the specs, right? You'd bid to the plans and the spec. And it's, it's funny because, you know, at Moss, we do a lot of, you know, commercial, private work, et cetera. And it's so much more relationships and, and you know, budgeting and talking through things, right? And I'm used to this kind of hard line, you know, line in the sand yeah. approach. Like, no, fucker, you said this. Like, yeah. this is what we're doing, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, this isn't on the plans. I'm charging you for this. No, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. Yeah, I'll, t I'll tell you in uh you know, we're, we're doing public now a little bit ourselves, but it's it's funny because, like, when we're doing the public work, it's so much easier to get approved on a change order, though. Yeah. Like, if they're like, oh, it's not on the plan. Yeah, just send us a number. No problem. Man, you're dealing with a real owner? Holy shit, dude. You're yeah. like, it's not in the plans, man. Like, you want this. But but you knew that it was going to be there, so you should have put money in your bid for that, <laughs> right? I'm like, hey, wait, what? <laughs> you wouldn't have gave me the job, dude. Yeah, exactly. The best part, this happened to us, oh, maybe a year ago. 
the geotech report said we're going to do 12 foot of select fill right for the building pad right well pete goes and looks in the structural notes and it's 14 foot and the structural engineer puts in the drawing will not proceed with building building if they do not put 14 foot of select we will bore and verify (laughs) so he bids it for 14 foot well we're like 15 grand higher than everybody else, you know? And they're like, just on that line item, not the whole bid, but just that line item. Like, well, I think that's why you guys are higher than everybody else. You guys got that one, that one line item is really sticking out. It's like 15 grand higher than everybody else. But, you know, everybody else, a couple hundred bucks of a jet. You know? Did they put how much on their proposal, how deep they were going? No, they just got select fill. Oh, did you read ours? Yeah. It says 14 foot. Well, that's not what the geotech said. Did you read the structural notes? Oh, no. <laughs> well, the owner already gave us the job with this other guy's number, but we wanted to use you. Oh, that's cool. You want me to send you a CO? Or you can just add it to the LOI? Oh, no, man. We can't do that. So we're going to go with the 12 foot. Okay. So we get out on the job. We didn't start the job. About two weeks later, they call me and they go, hey, can you send us back that number? <laughs> yeah, no problem. Well, in the meantime, in this two weeks, they decided they're going to call around and try and shop our number. Type of people they are. What? I'm not going to. That never happens. I'm not, I'm not going to put. Their <laughs> what are you name talking out. about? I'm not going to put their name out. But they decided we're going to we're going to do that. So yeah. So we uh, we <laughs> we uh, send the we send the uh, we send them the updated number, and a couple days later, we were doing a job right across the freaking highway from where this job was going to be. And my guys call me and they're like, hey, man, there's silt fence up out there. Like, That's fine because we're supposed to put the silt fence up. Well, they put their job trailer out and they put their sign up. They're like, oh, they're just getting ready. Maybe they're going to call us, tell us they did the erosion control out. Hey, dude, there's like two track loaders out there. Hey, there's an excavator out there. We have a signed fucking contract with these people, dude. Signed fucking contract. I walked off that job and started it. They just sued me. But if I sue them, oh, well, you know, we didn't like your number. That's the hypocrisy of this industry that I'm talking about. Yeah. And it starts with all of that. If they're not making that margin that they're supposed to make, they're not going to let you do it. Mm-hmm. Yep. But that comes back to, to to get out of the whole doom and gloom of this whole industry. <laughs> oh, I'm not trying to talk doom and gloom. <laughs> it, uh, it's, it's, it really it's comes true. back to knowing that there's ultimately two types of customers in the world. And it doesn't matter what business you're in. It doesn't matter what you're doing. There's customers that shop on value. And there's customers that shop on price. Yep. And you never want to work for a customer that shops on price because there's no loyalty there. There's no relationship. There's no nothing. You can do 10 jobs for them. They can love you. You can do the best job in the world. But if they shop on price, the next job that comes around and somebody comes in two bucks lower than you, they're taking them. You want to keep working for customers that shop on value. You want to be able to communicate the value you're going to provide to them by stuff like that. Oh, we read the engineering report and caught that mistake that would have cost them thousands of dollars in a change order later on in the job. But you got to be able to communicate your value and you got to know what your value is and you got to know how to provide it. And that's one of the hardest things to figure out when you get going yeah. in business. You can do that right. You're always going to have a customer. You're not going to have to necessarily be the cheapest guy all the time. You just have to be able to communicate your value and find the customers that are shopping for value. There's always a customer that shops on value. Yeah there's a lot less of them than the ones that shop on price, but there's a market for every, everything. And I think it's important to note too, that shit happens, right? Like it, we're going to have problems. A machine that I send out on rent is going to break down. You know, we're going to have a situation where you can't pay me because of something that happened on another job, whatever the case might be, but like, let's talk it out. Yeah, right. Let's find a solution. Huge. Right. Yeah. And, Instead, you know, instead of the, the, hey, let's hide this over here and do, not do this or just walk away from a, a bill because we can't pay it, whatever it might be, just let's talk about it. Let's find a solution together, what works for both parties and let's work it out, right? I think I think that's a big thing in this uh, in this industry is like when you find that value, you start building that relationship, right? And, and know that that relationship's a two-way street and sometimes I'm going to be the problem. Sometimes you might be the problem, whatever it is, but like, let's work together to find the solution yeah, and not have some grace too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Well, Brian, um, I wanted to ask you, so tell us how you started advanced track. We got about, mm, about 10 minutes left. 
So tell us a little bit how you actually started at Bands Track, like what got you wanting to make it what it is today. Yeah, so I uh, when I was three, I got I got introduced to my first piece of Caterpillar equipment through a, a promotional video <laughs> that uh, actually my grandma's boyfriend had an oil field service contract and he a contract company and he brought home this deal and I was done with the Disney movies and wanted to watch that from then on out. And so I've always had this like attraction to equipment, right? Just a, a passion for the mechanics around it, the passion for just the the iron in general. And then my uh, family started a rental business when I was 14 and I just kind of dove head first into it. And um, shortly after that, you know, go away to college, do that whole thing. And uh, in 2018, started working for the family again and just realized that I kind of wanted to set my own path and, and do my own thing and always wanted to just kind of put my own stamp on it, right? Um, and realized that the only way that was gonna happen is if I did it by myself and did it on my own. So. That's kind of what got me to the point of starting Advanced Track. And, you know, at first, like, you know, I have this idea, like, oh, I'd love it to be a rental business. And then, like, what kind of equipment? And then you realize uh, the banks aren't going to loan me any money. And then you finally, you know, a year and a half later, find someone dumb enough to do it. And uh, <laughs> and then you, and then your, your business, you think you have this, like, all right, I'm going to get, like we kind of talked to earlier, like, I'm going to go buy minis and skids and, you know, this very specific piece of equipment and so forth and and then that changes because you start getting a call from this guy over here and he needs a dozer and then you get a call the guy that needs a motor grader and now we kind of we've got big dreams i think our our goal is eventually just to kind of uh you know obviously grow the footprint uh here in dallas fort worth but also kind of keep some of the businesses or some of the business that um we've that we've been able to build down in central texas and and uh san antonio that area um but yeah, that's that's kind of the that's the immediate plan. I think the bigger plan is eventually to create something that can grow outside of the state and, you know, several pieces of equipment and so forth. Just got to find more and more capital to keep sinking back into the business. So I guess with the rental side of things is, is it typically the rental company that's going to finance direct from the OEM or you're going to do capital investment, go out and buy that piece of equipment kind of thing and, and do it that way? What's the what's the way that most of those companies grow? It, it, it all varies, honestly. There's third-party equipment uh, leasing companies that, that get heavily involved in some of these. There's even some private equity firms that have started investing in mm -hmm. smaller rental businesses, trying to kind of grow their portfolio. And then, yeah, you've got the OEMs too. I think the OEMs are somewhat more limiting from the standpoint of they're, you know, they're depending on who they're backed by, because a lot of those guys like you know, they, they might be branded as, you know, such and such financial, but at the end of the day, they're really just like Wells Fargo or, yeah. or backed by these bigger banks. And so their lending capacity, you know, especially once you get two, three, four machines in, five machines in, or even if you're a bigger company and you've got a hundred machines, at some point your, your, your capacity is going to yeah, be limited, capped. right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, some of these third party leasing companies and, and private equity firms, I think are, you know, kind of the, the better way to go. It's just a matter of, finding them right and and really being an attractive uh business for them to want to invest in you right mm. um so that's i mean obviously capital has been a huge constraint for us i mean uh, uh, we've had i miss a dozer rental every single week right i miss a motor grader rental every single week right but i don't have the capacity to go out and buy all these machines right so i think that's kind of the bigger uh piece of it is just understanding that this takes time and even though i want it to happen right this second it's it's you gotta you gotta go you know, crawl into, before you walk and walk before you run and you know yeah. it's, it's just a process here going into business for yourself is a long game it's not it's not a short game yeah no it definitely it's a marathon it's not a sprint and yeah. the guys that sprint they die really quick yeah those guys that blow up overnight you see them everywhere a couple years later they're gone yeah and it's it's sad but it's true Especially because of how slow we're paid, and it, it's just it's uh, this industry is just it's really tough. You gotta you gotta have some grit to you, man. And you gotta like Devin's saying, you gotta find the right guys to work for, and you gotta you gotta you gotta pull your bootstraps up sometimes and <laughs> make bad, tough decisions. And that's what's gonna separate you from the rest, man. That's what's gonna make you successful in this business. Yeah, you know, um, I really appreciate you coming on tonight, Brian. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been fun. We uh we definitely want to have you back. Yeah, sounds uh, great. You know, um 
to try and get Garrett to come on. You know, he's too cool to come on the show. But <laughs> maybe he'll watch it and laugh, and maybe he'll call me and say, "Yeah, I'll come on finally." Yeah, yeah, sounds uh, good. Or we'll have you. We'll have to have you guys over at yeah, uh, yeah, our heard, studio too. They're, they're getting their own podcast, dude. Oh, uh, shit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're getting ready to getting ready to fire up here in the next probably next month around or so. equipment and stuff. Or what's the plan? No, it'll be. I, I, we don't really have like a. A, a steadfast like this is absolutely what the the show is going to talk about we're gonna we're really aiming it towards the internal side and then our hope is is that we can kind of utilize that on the external side of the business but we really nice. want to just tell stories about the industry where we kind of uh you know how those stories apply to not just construction but outside uh this you know outside the walls of construction as well so um it'll be cool it's going to be exciting to get to hear some stories from some of the guys in the field that work for us and guys that started as laborers who are project managers now and um that's pretty uh there's a lot of people who've who've grown exponentially in a very short period of time at moss so it'll be cool to tell their stories that's Absolutely, awesome. man I mean, when we have you on next time, we'll talk about Moss. I really want to get into it about yeah. Moss because Moss's story is freaking awesome, dude. It's an amazing company. And then Garrett, you, and those guys over there got nothing but respect. Hell, they're great friends of mine now. I mean, <laughs> I talk to these guys at least once a month. So, yeah. Um, so, guys, I appreciate uh, you guys listening uh, on Spotify. Give us our five stars. YouTube, please like and subscribe. Um, we're going to put some questions on here. By the way, we have a Patreon now. So if you could check out our Patreon, it is in the link below on the bottom of the video. So, uh, Devin, always a pleasure, my brother. Thanks for having me on, man. Like, share, subscribe. Let us know if you guys want us to talk about anything else. Questions, comments, make fun of us. You know, it's all good. Yeah. You know, you are famous on TikTok for that. Yeah, I guess I'm I'm, I'm an idiot, apparently, according to everyone on TikTok. <laughs> The keyboard warriors. Keyboard, keyboard warriors. warriors. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. We'll see you next time. Later.